friends here because we are discussing a tremendously important topic. This is about creating jobs in Asia, and we are looking at the entrepreneurship equation. I would say this is not an equation, it's a tautology, it's an identity. In order to create jobs, we need to unleash the entrepreneurial potential, not just within Indonesia, but within East Asia and the larger whole. And on this morning's conversation, I have such a wonderful panel that I cannot do them justice by just talking and introducing them. But I'll do a very quick intro, and in a little while, you'll be hearing from each of them as I get a question going. Uh, on my left right now is Pagita. Pagita is the chairman of the Investment Coordinating Board, known as BK BKPM Indonesia. I must tell you, he's one of the most hardworking officials in the forum. I saw Gita in a breakfast session. I'm seeing him here. I'm hoping not to see him at lunch. <laughs> and he's very hardworking. Then we have Kojima-san. Uh, Kojima-san carries a big hat. He's chairman of the board of the Mitsubishi Corporation Japan, but he also double heads as vice chairman of Japan's Business Federation. So he's speaking on behalf of all the global MNCs from Japan. And of course, next to him, we have Bart Sehat, and he is such an important face that I'm delighted to have him here on the panel. He's homegrown Indonesian, and he's been, all right, founder, chairman, CEO of Marvel Technology last 30 years. And therefore, it's critical that we cannot talk about entrepreneurship without a real-life entrepreneur, homegrown Indonesian entrepreneur. Next to him, we are very fortunate, we have Mr. Shimada. Mr. Shimada carries the hat as president of the International Textile, Garment and Leather Workers Federation in Japan. He has a million workers as his members within Japan and 10 million textile workers across Asia. So he does want to oblige us by speaking in Japanese because then he could get real passionate. So I do hope that you've all got your little translator equipment with you because he wanted to talk to us in Japanese and then we'll get it translated. Next to Mr. Shimada is Sarah. Sarah's a wonderful friend. When I told the WEF committee I cannot have an entrepreneurship panel without a woman, don't you agree? And she's not just a woman, she's a social entrepreneur, all right? And she carries with her this passion of having built up Ida and coming up to five years where she equips women from different countries in Asia with a set of business skills so that when they return home, they could get the business started. And I really, really wanted Sarah on this panel. And last but not least, uh, we have one of the best brains, all right, from PwC. Oh, Dennis, that puts pressure on you, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> we have Dennis. Just a bit, yeah. yeah, it's intentional. <laughs> Dennis Nelly, chairman of PwC International USA, and Dennis is so passionate about the idea of grooming talent for entrepreneurship, but also equally concerned about the shortage of human capital driving many of the MNCs in the region. So to get started, I'm going to start with Bagita, given that he's from the host country. Bagita, for you. We have a lot of people in the audience today thanking you for having brought in a lot of investments into Indonesia. And for all of us, we want to know, give us something new, give us something exciting. What is Indonesia doing now to ensure that innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship can be nurtured in the country? Wow. <laughs> that's, that's a 24-hour discussion. But uh, I, I think the first initiative or the first deliverable would have to be for the Indonesian government and the Indonesian people to basically enlarge the economic pie. And the economic pie certainly has been enlarging in the past few years, but I think it has to continue enlarging at a faster and higher rate. At such time, I think we can start thinking about crafting the necessary policies because I do believe that policy can be helpful in shaping anybody's behavior 
to do anything. Now, you raised the question and idea of innovation and entrepreneurialism in Indonesia. Uh, I think it's, it's fair to say, admittedly, that we're perhaps not as entrepreneurial as the Chinese and the Indians are in terms of absolute and relative terms. But it doesn't necessarily negate the point that there is entrepreneurialism in Indonesia. Pak Sehat is a notable example of that, and there is many others. But I think to do that, we've got to ensure that in the next 10, 15, and 20 years, there needs to be ample investment in basically education and making sure that the education is geared towards making sure that people will be able to take on more risk. And if I'm talking about a calculated risk here. And of course, that's going to need, you know, equity or capital. We have seen many examples in China and India, Narayan Murthy, the founder of Emphasis, who basically started out with $250 against the tidal waves of the government's unwillingness mm. and inability to basically protect and promote and encourage, you know, whatever he was trying to do 20, 30, or even, you know, earlier uh, than 20 to 30 years ago. But he was already having the conviction that in the U.S. there was going to be this robust demand for whatever he was going to be doing in the years to come. And I think, you know, for anybody to have that kind of convic conviction, it's more, f it's more possible in many places. In Indonesia, that's prevalent already. But it has to be on a path where we can actually institutionalize it so that there is, you know, scale that, that, that I think can translate into even bigger scale in the, in, in, in the future. That, I think, is going to have to require policy making which unfortunately or fortunately has to be driven by the enlargement of the economic pie in Indonesia. Okay, so Indonesia has been growing quite nicely. What's your unemployment rate right now? Unemployment is at about seven to eight percent. Mm -hmm. uh, the Millennium Development Goals, you know, in the next three to four years so would be for that to come down to the four or five percent. It's on, it's been on a declination and I think it's continuing to decline. Uh, poverty is the other thing that we're trying to achieve. It's hovering around the 13% and we're trying to bring that down a few points more. I think we're going to achieve those goals, but we have to make sure that, you know, while we do that, people get more and more ed educated. And I have to bring this point up, uh, you know, the number of PhDs in Indonesia is not even close to, you know, anywhere that the Indians and the Chinese have. You know, we only have 14,000 PhDs alive and kicking in Indonesia, mm -hmm. <coughs> compared to 500,000 PhDs in China and the same number in India. And the rate at which we're producing PhDs is far smaller on, an, on a relative and absolute basis compared to those two countries. I think there needs to be some game changing. And I think we can afford to do it because fiscally speaking, we have the pool of money. We just need to tweak it a little bit so that we can actually be gearing the educational system for the production of more PhDs so that we can have about 100,000 PhDs in the next 20 years. Oh. Surely we have to also look after the other elements of the tertiary stuff. Now, I think this is going to translate to, I think, a, a larger value of entrepreneurship in Indonesia going forward. Thank you very much. We'll come back to the education sector in a little while. Fujimasan, yeah, we come to you right now. Um, Mitsubishi is a big company. There are many big Japanese companies. So I'm very excited when you say you want to talk about how to build an entrepreneurial mindset within Japanese companies. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction, Ms. Kosan. Yes. And uh, as you mentioned, I'm a chairman of the Mitsubishi Corporation. Therefore, later on, I'll explain about the, uh, how to educate or encourage the younger people. Mm -hmm. But uh, talking about Asia, okay. and uh, I'm uh, very bullish about Asia's future because of all the young, talented people like you 
in the room, I myself is very old, but the younger generation is very active. According to the uh, National Science Foundation, Asia's college age population is uh, far greater than that of EU and the United States combined. And uh, furthermore, the number of the science and the engineering uh, uh, bachelor degrees uh, rose significantly in the 1990s in Asia and uh, nearly double that of the EU and the United States. I believe having a pool of very much talented people, young people here in Asia is one of the keys for the continued growth in Asia. Okay. And for this to happen, I believe it is very important for Asia to create uh, kind of a regional ecosystems patterned after Silicon Valley in which talented young people can maximize the, their potential. This is very important. It is no secret that the new technologies and the business models emerge in Silicon Valley with the participation of many Asian entrepreneurs and engineers. Mm -hmm. I suggest we make it easier for people with a strong entrepreneurial spirit to move easily across the border to create such ecosystem in Asia. That is very, very important, I think. This will allow talented people to return from overseas and create entrepreneurial opportunities right here in our own backyard. As a matter of fact, such a trend has already begun. China is expected to ease application requirements for their version of a green card to attract foreigners with engineering and uh, entrepreneurial backgrounds. Mm. One of the uh, se secret uh, uh, sectors likely uh, to become a future engine of job growth in Asia is clean alternative energy. As the population uh, continues to increase and the economies continue to grow, it is inevitable that the demand for energy will rise. We believe this will become one of the most important industrial sectors as nations grapple with how to balance energy needs with environmental concerns. This is very, very important. Uh, Mitsubishi Corporation has uh, taken the uh, initiative in this area by creating uh, new organizations and uh, kind of research and development type of organizations and uh, the name is the Global Environmental Business Development Group. Mm. Several years ago, this is closely related this uh, kind of, uh, you know, entrepreneurship type of business. Mm. And uh, this organization has to report directly to the CEO. Okay. And uh, we are currently working on the energy efficient smart city program in India. Mm. And uh, incidentally, uh, this sector has been a hot topic in Silicon Valley as evidenced by development of advanced batteries mm. and electric cars, mm. energy efficient technologies and so forth. As a result, I see potential to further connect Silicon Valley with Asia. Mm. And uh, the key to fostering and educating young people in the new industrial sectors is to provide ample opportunity for them to exercise their initiative. And uh, even though our company is uh, bigger, and, uh, but uh, Mitsubishi Corporation currently have 32 different nationalities, overseas hires, working in the Tokyo, and uh, Tokyo headquarters. And uh, out of 32, 27 of them coming from Asia. I enjoy talking to these young men and women as they provide me with the new ideas and uh, new ways of looking at things to find out new ideas, uh, new suggestions for the next year's business, future business. The important communication is the uh, vertical communication and horizontal communication. Vertical means the, uh, you know, we will cross the uh, generation borders mm -hmm. and uh, the Horizontal uh, communication means to cross over the uh, uh, 
cross road and the country, company, and the, uh, the, the neighbors and the everybody. And uh, those uh, horizontal vertical, you know, communication is uh, very, very important for future to analyze what will be necessary for the new business. And besides, one more thing. Yes. Uh, to me, entrepreneurship is uh, not about the size of a company, mm -hmm. but the mindset. For example, we establish an in-house venture system mm -hmm. to help young employees with an entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. launch new business, and uh, this is very important. Proposals are screened. Younger generation proposes so many things. We will have a chance, we will give them a chance to propose. And though selected, uh, provided with half of the necessary startup capital from the company, half of them, they'll invest by themselves. Okay. And to form a new company. And uh, some of the uh, successful business ventures have been uh, launched this way, such as an uh, internet traveling company or a shopping guy or some uh, new type of eating establishment and so forth. Mm. And uh, quite recently I had a chance to talk one of them and he is a former Mitsubishi Corporation's employee but he is now president mm. and uh, he is now managing a small venture company. Now this company is uh, getting bigger okay. and uh, in that sense almost uh, say 200 CEO used to work for Mitsubishi Corporation, now working outside of Mitsubishi. Okay. This kind of education is very, very important. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Kojima-san. Uh, we will come back to this in a little while, <laughs> okay. yeah? But I hear consistently, you know, Silicon Valley as the model. So, Sihad, you've been in Silicon Valley, you've got a PhD, all right, life and kicking, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> And so my question for you is, how do you unleash potential of IT-based companies? You were feeling very strongly that there's so much technology companies in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. How do you get them to do it right, to become yeah, like a Marvel? Kojima-san, that's for Sehat first. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't mind if we could answer some of the questions. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, thank you, for Professor Ko. Uh, you know, I... As, you, as uh, you know, I was uh, I was born here. And I gr grew up uh, uh, over in, in Jakarta, Indonesia. And one thing I can say is that most people that I know of in Indonesia, they are one way or another, they are entrepreneurs. They are always thinking about business. Okay? Uh, I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to open this uh, business and that. I need to do uh, 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 make money. Okay, uh, how to make getting rich. So I think we don't have to teach Indonesian uh, to think to be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I, I, I realized at a very early stage when I was young. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but then I was wondering, say, why is it that uh, we don't develop uh, new in industries that's, that could be seen outside Indonesia? Well, I think I didn't know about how to answer this question until I, until I went to the U.S. and to see how things are done differently over there. Uh, and then I started to realize that uh, it's not because we don't have the, the, uh, the mentality of being uh, entrepreneurs. I think what's that's missing in Indonesia is the, the environment, the, 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 the circumstances are quite unique. In Indonesia, so okay, we the, the the we are blessed with okay with okay, rich natural resources and all that other stuff, and uh, and we tend to take things for uh, to take the easiest route. Uh, it's easier to uh, buy and sell, to import and consume, instead build and make mistakes and screw up and uh, rebuild and or fail and then redo it again, and, uh, and have to compete with with everybody else in the world and then. Uh, have sleepless nights, okay, along the way, and getting white hairs, okay, uh, not knowing that you can survive. So, so we have these environments where we, okay, where people they took the the easier route, okay, uh, 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 got rewarded very very quickly, 
Uh, and it's, the reason is because we have a huge consumer base. Mm -hmm. We have huge internal consumption base. We have large inefficiency in our system. So we could have hundreds of uh, businesses doing the same, the same thing and okay, not competing with each other. Uh, and the reason they don't have to compete with each other or because they're all just buying stuff from Japan or from Taiwan or now uh, in the past and now in buying or from Germany and now it's buying from China. And they all can be successful uh, making money, getting rich, become a, 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 have a, 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 a good life. And, and really this is discouraged. I think this is this thing discouraged the, 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 uh, the, the, for, for, the, for the people to take chances on to do things that you know there's no guarantee to be successful. Well, instead, if you look at, okay, uh, like myself, when I went to the, to, the, to, the, to, to the state, I went to school and then worked for startup companies, and I noticed the vast majority of startup companies in semiconductors, they fail. But the one that succeed, they succeed like blockbuster. They, are, they, are, they are become big. Okay, case in point, okay, uh, uh, Marvell. Uh, we started this comp uh, uh, started my, myself and my wife, which is also in the audience here, uh, with my brother started this, uh, this business uh, uh, 16 years ago. And you know, the first five years, you wonder whether we will, will survive or not, uh, competing with the biggest of the biggest companies in the world. Well, they have huge advantage. They have the most. They have more money. They have more resources. They have more, more uh, 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 branding. They have basically anything you can think of. They can hire the best people in the world. Uh, they can pay more. Okay. They can have. The, they have better buildings. They have better, better uh, uh, business. Better have everything. Better customer base. Uh, so, so what? Okay, so we yet, yet we could compete. So we know that. The one thing I can tell you can, that in technology for sure. Okay, uh, uh, people they have unique ideas, unique differentiation, can compete with the biggest of the biggest in the world. Okay, we, people they have seemingly impossible uh, 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 advantages, so yet we, can, we could compete and succeed. Uh, uh, but but then okay, uh, the environment's different. Okay, so, okay, we have okay, okay, nobody. People started companies over there and then fail. Did not get labeled as failure, mm. for example. Uh, they don't have this uh, incentive to be like, like, they don't have this inefficiency in the infrastructure so that you can have a, a thousand people, hundreds of thousand, or a thousand people doing the same stuff, import and selling. So they need, in order for them to survive, actually, they, they, can, they need to use their, 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 uh, their knowledge that they learn in schools, okay, uh, or, or their skills to, to build new products to, 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 to differentiate themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have huge customer base. Well, I guess they use, they do, okay, in the U.S. do have. But if you look at China, uh, uh, 30 years ago, they did, even though they have huge population, they did not have the customer base to consume internally. So they have no choice but to build things and to export. So I think, okay, uh, we need to learn some of this, uh, 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 some of the success uh, uh, for, from different countries and some of the unique, uniqueness about these different countries uh, on how they could succeed in in capturing the 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 the, uh, the, the growth of the uh, the wealth the, uh, the wealth growth uh, that is tied to uh, technological uh, uh, industry. So I think Indonesia could have okay, or also okay, participate in the portion of the job creations. That, sh that should be tied to the technological industries. Uh, those, 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 uh, those, however, uh, uh, may somewhat, we, we need to tailor that somewhat differently compared to any, uh, some of the countries that in the past have succeeded into, the, uh, into, into, into capturing some of these manufacturing jobs. So for example, uh, since we have a huge uh, consumer base already, in-house, they are already buying stuff. We're already importing, I don't know, like uh, 100 million cell phones a year, maybe, uh, or, or, or at, at least 50 million, maybe 100 million units. Mm -hmm. So we're already spending money. We're already consuming it. So we just need to, 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 to have somehow these products to be start maybe to be manufactured <coughs> or partly manufactured here and slowly grow into building more and more uh, components more in, uh, 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 over time, 
and then, and then but consume consume in uh, locally. So I think some of these things could, could be could be could be could be achieved by having government to create uh, uh, incentives, okay, to people to to be able to 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 start over here and be competitive against the Chinese. Okay, if we don't have a, a, a way to be competitive... We will, we will talk about that, the role of the government, in a little yeah. while, Sehat. Yeah, right. that, that's great. Thank right. you. Okay. Right. And then I, might, I need all of us now to kind of use our headphone because okay. we are going to go to Mr. Shimada. And for you, Mr. Shimada, my question is very simple. Uh, what do you think is the key role of employer all right, in helping workers plan for restructuring within an industry or within a company? はい、えー、それでは、えー、使用者というか経営者の役割についてお話ししたいと思います。特に、えー、私は労働組合の出身ですから、そういう意味では、えー、今お話しされた経営をされている方から見れば、ちょっと視点が違うかなという話になるかもしれません。ただ、私どもが思っている経営が経営者の役割としては、4つあるというふうに思っております。一つは間違いなく従業員の生活保障というものがあると思います。そしてもう一つは当然企業家ですから企業を成長させていかなきゃいけない、維持しなきゃいけない、それに対する投資を確保すると。そして企業にお金を出資している、要するに株主への還元があります。トータルとしては国あるいは地域を含めて儲けたものに対して社会貢献としてそれを地域に還元をしていくこの4つのことがまず大事ではないかと思っていますただそうは言ってもこの従業員がいなければ企業経営はできませんまあ本当にあのロボットだけで経営していれば別ですけど基本的にはロボットにしても人が動かしていると考えればこの人というものに対して十分対応できなければやっぱりそれは経営者ではないんではないかというふうに思っています。特にアジア、特にこの東アジアだけを考えればあるのは、ここは皆さんもご存知のように、一つの、我々社員でも言ってもそうですけども、世界の生産地であることは間違いありません。ただし逆に人口も世界の何割も占めている中でいけば、消費国であるということも間違いないわけです。そうしたときに、多くの人に所得がなければ、その消費する力がなければ、その企業というのは成り立たないわけです。したがって、今、グローバル企業ということが言われてますけれども、私が考える企業というのは、やっぱり自国内で起こした企業というものは、本来、自国の従業員に対して、そこで生活できる賃金を払うべきであろうと。いくら海外で儲けたお金を国お国に渡したとしても、それは国民に対しては何の、あるいは住民に対しては何の影響もないというふうに思っています。ある意味で言えば、極端な言い方かもしれませんけれども、雇用を守るために、特に繊維産業でしたら、先ほどあるようにリストラがありますけど、技術の進歩によって、機械を入れることによって雇用を減らすことがあります。でも僕らが考えるのは、もしできるのであれば、技術、生産の質、要するに物の質を上げるための機械化であるならば、それは入れなければいけない。ではなく、単に人はいっぱいいるんだ、その時に物流として物を A 点から B 点運ぶのを機械化するということを本当にし,てしたほうがいいのかどうかというのは考えていただきたいなと、もしできるなら、それはまだ人手でやっておいてほしいなという部分があると思います。そういうふうにして逆にいろんな人たちに働く人に生活賃金を払ってもらうとともに経営側が取るお金もちょっと減らしていただいて極端にアメリカのように経営者は従業員のうん百万倍を取るというんじゃなくても10倍でもいいですから経営者は経営なりのお金を取って残りを従業員に割り振っていく生活のために割り振っていくようなことをしていただくと。いろんな意味で二極化を作らないと思います。特に私の言っている分で言えば、特に都市部と農村部の貧富の差ができるように、いろんな意味で貧富の差ができる
であれば、自国内でのまず、えー、労働の確保することを優先する経営者らを作っていただきたいというのがわれわれの考え方です。そういう中において、いろんな機械化等において合理化が起こった、えー、時にどうするかという部分になれば、当然、今申し上げましたように、企業としては、従業員の雇用を守る雇用、生活を保障していくという責任を負っていただくわけですから、新しい産業、新しいものに雇用を、従業員を移そうとしたときは、当然そのためには、訓練をしなければ、新しい産業に対する訓練をしなきゃいけない、一般的にはこれは国でしなさいという話かもしれないけれども、われわれから考えれば、やっぱりこれは、自分たちの従業員を次の産業に渡すわけですから、当然、企業が責任を持って訓練をして、次の産業にバトンタッチをしていくというのが、われわれの考え方です。ちょっといいとこづくめかもしれませんけど、われから言えば、当然、労働組合から言えば、企業はまず従業員があって、その雇用を守って、自分が雇用を切らなきゃいけないときは、それを次の産業に対して頼むよと言って、バトンタッチしていく。そのためには自分たちもお金を払ってちゃんと経営していくということ、うん、サービス、あるいは訓練していくことが大事だというふうに思っております。以上です。ありがとうございます。Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a very provocative idea. I'm sure my employers on this panel will have something to say about that in a little while. So let's try and hear from Sarah now. Sarah, you've been doing this great stuff in IDA, and I'm sure you keep account of all the records of all these women who have graduated. With this set of skills. Are they all female entrepreneurs now working in back in their hometown? And is there a challenge trying to get them to that next level? What should society be doing?、Uh, challenges. Yeah, no, IDA is not working exclusively with women any longer.、Um, our foundation was with women and particularly domestic workers in Singapore, but we are now reaching out to a much broader constituency of the hopeful poor.、Um, Challenges. Let me, let me speak sort of more generally about the challenges that I think face、um, entrepreneurs within the hopeful poor collective. I, th this, I, I would say the first challenge、um, is a surprising one. I think there's too much micro enterprise.、Mm. That's not one we would imagine as a, as a challenge, actually.、Um, we see micro enterprise everywhere, and it is a brilliant, brilliant、um, Problem to have in a sense, too much micro enterprise.、Um, this is all the consequence of the、um, micro enterprise movement, micro credit. Brilliant. I gather here in, in Indonesia we actually have some 51 million micro enterprises. My understanding is that in Philippines, for example, 97, 96, 97% of the business establishments are micro enterprises. Yeah? But that's a problem because micro enterprise is not what fuels economic development. Micro enterprise is a wonderful place to start. Yeah? But we need to grow micro enterprise into small business. Small business is the foundation of economic development. Small business is what generates employment opportunity. Small business is what pays tax revenue. Small business is what inspires other businesses to, to grow. Micro enterprise, again, is a brilliant start, but it is not what we need as economies.、Yeah? We need to move people up. A second reason why I, I think there is a challenge, or why I say there's too much micro enterprise, is because it is revealing of the ambivalent entrepreneurial attitude of the poor.、Yeah? I just, many, many of the women who come to IDA, many, many of the hopeful poor with whom I have spoken, actually don't want to be entrepreneurs. They find it enormously risky. <laughs> But for them, there is no other option. With the hopeful poor, we are talking about individuals who are living on $2 a day. When you are living on $2 a day, your children are hungry. Your children may be ill, and there is, is no money to go to the doctor. There is no option for you to not engage in business. You must do that if you want your children to survive.、Yeah? But it's not necessarily what they feel equipped to do. 
they are enormously risk averse. What business should I go into? Could I really make it? I'm going to need some, some money in order to start this building, this business, excuse me. And that money is hard won. Yeah. It's very surprising. There are many, many families in Philippines and in Indonesia and India and Sri Lanka that will work to scrape together 2,000 US dollars, huge sum of money, to send their wives or their daughters overseas to be employed as maids rather than invest that sum in a business. If they could take $2,000 and invest it in a business, my goodness, they could have something significantly greater than a micro enterprise. Wow. But no, <coughs> micro enterprise is too risky. They would rather send their daughter or their wife off overseas to potentially experience dramatic exploitation. Yeah. But the salary will be a sure thing. And there will be remittances that can come potentially for years. Small business is considered to be too risky. We need to clearly deal with that, yeah, if we are going to grow our economies. I think that we need to recognize first and foremost that if we are to have vibrant entrepreneurs amongst the poor, and if we are to move beyond microenterprise, we need to understand that Micro-entrepreneurs need more than just credit. They also need business insight and savvy, mm -hmm. and they need confidence. Ida works now to, or we aspire to be, the world's micro-business school. I feel passionately that the greatest investment that we can make in business leaders is at the <coughs> bottom of the pyramid. All of the individuals who leave Ida, all of the women who graduate, all the men who are graduating now from Ida can do transformative things by really growing small businesses in their communities, they can lift not just their families, but potentially entire communities out of poverty. I think it's a better investment um, to put education into them than into potentially the INSEAD MBAs I used to teach. Um, I think that the world may be a better place if we produce a few more of these IDA graduates as opposed to INSEAD graduates, even though INSEAD is a wonderful, wonderful institution. Um, yeah, but, but we need to see that um, entrepreneurs need more than just credit. They need, we at IDA think very systematically about the kinds of psychological growth that they require, the confidence, the self-esteem, the, the hope, the, the internal locus of control. Um, they need also to have, obviously, real management capability, technolog technological insight. They need business plans. And the business plans that the ladies turn out at IDA, um, again, the vast majority of whom are are made, 25 pages, single spaced, tight, replete with cash flow analysis. There's absolutely no issues with their abilities to think big. And they come out and they produce small business as opposed to micro enterprise. And this is. Thank you. Thing. Thank you, Sarah. I could tell you're still passionate about this project. Mm. Yeah. And we'll come back to you about SMEs and what governments could do to help them. And to finish up this round robin, Dennis. You've, you've done a CEO survey under PwC where you actually say you have all these graduates coming out from universities and yet all the MNCs operating in Asia are finding a tremendous talent shortage. What's going on here? Why this huge gap between the demand and the supply for talent? Yeah, thanks, Annie. It's, it's, uh, and good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you. Um, <clears throat> You know, I think one of the common themes that uh, really has been expressed by many on the, on the panel today is really going at this whole issue of talent and, and skill gaps and the shortages that exist really around the world is the way I would describe it. Um, and, um, you know, it's almost like we're getting to the point of saying uh, skill gaps, skill shortages is becoming the new normal in terms of how we need to think about these issues uh, on a go-forward basis. Um, you mentioned our, uh, the PwC CEO survey, um, you know, very comprehensive survey. Um, we uh, we uh, uh, involved over 1,200 CEOs from around the world. We're able to cut the survey into a lot of different uh, areas. And in particular, we, we try to cut it on a geographic basis. And what I just want to share a couple of points with you here this morning. As it relates to Asia, as it relates to Asia, uh, when, when you ask the CEOs, what is the, the number one business challenge that they're dealing with that could inhibit, inhibit their ability to grow, talent is the number one issue they mention. 
So when you think about <clears throat> the tremendous opportunities that exist in this region, um, and they, they talk about how to capitalize on those, uh, those opportunities, the number one issue is talent, skill gaps that they don't have the ability to, to solve today. And I will tell you that uh, statistic is not dissimilar whether you go to North America, you go to Europe, or other parts of the world as well. The skill issue is uh, front and center for all. The, the issue is so predominant here in Asia that when you go on to talk to the CEOs and, and you, you talk about changes to their business strategy in the upcoming 12 months, the whole area of the, the human capital agenda, over 90% of the CEOs are saying they're going to make fundamental changes, shifts to how they manage talent in their organization, and I think that confirms the fact that, you know, this is top of mind and something that really uh, needs to be, be addressed, uh, not only as it relates to how you think about talent in, in your home country, but also how you're thinking about how you manage talent across, uh, across the border. Um, so some very interesting statistics coming out of that CEO survey that really confirm, I think, everything that's been said here this morning. In a recent PwC survey that we've just uh, completed, very interesting statistic that says one out of four high potential employees will be leaving their company in the next 12 months. <laughs> one out of four. Now, when you think about what we've been talking about in terms of talent, how you manage the opportunities, capitalize on uh, some significant uh, challenges in the, into the future, if one out of four of your top uh, performers is contemplating moving to another organization, that's a significant business challenge that, that really needs to be addressed. So what are some of the solutions? What are some of the ideas that are out there to really address, um, you know, this issue? Well, first and foremost, we, we would suggest that uh, the human capital agenda has to be owned by the CEO. In other words, the, you know, this issue is such a strategic importance that if the CEO is not championing this area of focus, no different than innovation, technology, uh, or, you know, market share issues, whatever, whatever those priorities have been in the past, um, this is not going to get the kind of traction and type of focus that you need in your organization. So the human cap uh, capital agenda has to be driven by the CEO. Secondly, when you step back and you really try to understand what's going on in the minds of some of our younger employees, um, we refer to them as the Gen Ys. Um, they think about their jobs very differently than what many of us up here have thought about our careers in the past. Uh, they're looking for much more than a job, much more than a salary. Um, they're, they're looking for what does a company stand for, corporate responsibility, its values. Um, they're looking for experience, development. The employee agreement that you have with your workforce needs to be refocused to be attendant to today's environment. And I think in many instances, that's a real shift for, for many companies. The third area we would talk about deals with this whole issue of international mobility. Um, we, we talk about this is not just a world that you're competing on in your home territory. This is a global world. Employees need to have experience. They need to have skills that allow them to compete in a much more complex environment. And how you focus uh, the agenda around international mobility, I think, is very critical. And the last area I would focus on, I think we're going to talk about uh, this later, deals with the whole question of what is the role of business and government in dealing with the whole issue of education? And, and how do you really enhance the educational system that's out there to make those systems more relevant, uh, more pertinent to the types of skills that uh, need to be imparted to, uh, to the workforce, not today, but just into the future as well. So I think, I think the issue is is real, it's not going away, it needs a lot of focus and attention, and uh, I think uh, the business community has a real role to play in this process if in fact we're going to be successful. Thank you, Dennis. That was great. And I want to engage the audience very quickly. So before we jump to them, one very quick question, just jump to the mic whenever you feel that inspired. Um, the role of government, you know, keeps popping up. Do we have too much government or too little government in helping entrepreneurs? Uh, Peter, Peter wants oh. to go first. Yeah, Peter, go okay. ahead. Okay, oh, thanks. Uh, uh, I happen to be lectured of uh, free markets uh, 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 practically all my life in, in the state. But when I look at this, okay, the situations in, the, in Indonesia, 
I do not think that complete free markets will work. So the, the government needs to have a role of nurturing uh, 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 the, the country to go to the free market in, in the right steps. For example, because of, as I said earlier, because we have this huge inefficiency in, our, uh, in the country, okay, if we, let's say, want to build, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a cell phone company, they will manufacture cell phones in the, in the States from the ground up. Okay, money will not solve the problem. So if the government says, okay, here's uh, $5 billion to build that, that $5 billion will go to the drain because okay, if you allow that, uh, that company to start to compete with the free markets with, with a huge efficiency gain in, other, in, 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 in Taiwan or in China, you will never be able to succeed. So we need to have to step to the right steps for the government to create the proper incentive, proper, proper uh, uh, investments in education to to build the, uh, build, building the infrastructure, the, the, the transportation systems, and so on, uh, 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 to, 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 to so that over time, over 10, 20 years, be able to build uh, an industry that can compete uh, with, with the rest of the world. Now, one way to, to speed up, to speed things up a, a, a little bit, uh, 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 significantly, maybe I should say a little bit, to speed things significantly is to have a policy to lure some of these multinational companies from they are, they are very strong in other parts of the world to come to the, to the, to the country, uh, give them some in okay, incentives or programs, whatever it is, to, 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 to incentivize them to, to, to build the, the manufacturing in our soil in, the, in, in Indonesia. And then hopefully over time, uh, they, will be, they will create, they will spring uh, supporting industry around them because after all, even the biggest of the biggest company in the world will still need to buy components from suppliers. So they can decide to buy the suppliers from Japan from, from far, far away distances, or they can have local suppliers to supply them components. So I think naturally over time, okay, those industry will, will come, okay, the, uh, more people will want to go to, to, to take uh, the master and PhD programs in, uh, uh, in schools because they know that those jobs will be available Okay, when they graduate, and companies like us could help. Okay, we could go in and to, to enable some of these uh, jumpstart programs, right. for example. Yeah. So, Gita, you want to come in? I know, but Gita, Look, yeah. A few a few years ago, we implemented a policy of having at minimum three passengers in a car if you were to swing by Sudirman and Tamarind roads. Yeah. This was called the three-in-one. Guess what happened days later after the policy was implemented? You saw a bunch of commoners on the sides of the streets who would offer their service to be jockeys so that they could make five to 10,000 rupees you know, on a per ride basis. And this would have included women, men, kids, and some Baby. women carrying babies. <laughs> Guess what happened? It created a thriving industry in itself and by itself. So the notion that Indonesia is not short of its entrepreneurial spirit, <laughs> absolutely true beyond a shadow of a doubt. But it is only true, the truism is only to the extent that it is equipped to do. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about equipping every citizen of Indonesia, it is to the extent of how they're educated. Now the question is, the, what is the probability of the next Bill Gates being wow. born out of Papua as opposed to the U.S.? It boils down to the quality and extent of the education that's provided. Mm. Unless and until the government takes a pretty proactive view about this, mm -hmm. I don't think Indonesia can expect much mm. beyond whatever it can do within the entrepreneurial spirit or domain. Now, I think the role of government in Indonesia is changing because of its increasing economic pie. Mm. But if we were to envision Indonesia being a knowledge-based economy in the, in the next five years, don't think so. I mean, you know, I had this discussion uh, last night and the nights before. I mean, there is no, you know, there is still an argument about, you know, the sanctities of contracts, dispute resolutions, and all the mechanisms that would be there to protect the downside mm. of anybody's risks. Mm. And, you know, make reference to the Wall Street. You know, the, the limited partners had very little skin on the game to the extent that they were basically so willing and ready to take so much risk mm -hmm. as a result of which, look what happened in 2008. I think a human being 
will be able to take mm -hmm. on whatever risk as long as he or she is educated, as long as he or she knows that there is a downside protection. The fact is, in Indonesia, the spending on R&D is a mere 0.07 percent of its GDP. Wow. As compared to any other modern nation or modernizing nation, which is spending already 1 percent of its GDP on R&D. Mm. We're not there yet. You know, in Singapore, if you put up an ad on a billboard that would promote Singapore, whether it's entitled, you know, uniquely Singapore or come to Singapore or whatever, you know this, Annie, yeah. they get double tax deductible. Yep. When I talk about this in the cabinet, you know, some don't get it. <laughs> and, you know, imagine what it would take for me to try to promote to the government. You know, tomorrow we're going to have to try to promote Bloomberg to open their headquarter office in Jakarta. Well, you know, if we were to want to do that, we've got to at least try to replicate what the Singaporeans did by virtue of taking a fiscal view on things, giving fiscal incentives so that the Bloombergs, the Pricewaterhouse of the world, the Ernst and Youngs of the world don't have to pay taxes so that they can, you know, base their headquarter in Jakarta or whatever. Okay, so will in this defense? happen today? No. <laughs> but will this happen in my lifetime? Absolutely beyond a shadow right. of a doubt. In defense of Singapore, it's not just about tax incentives, it's also about human capital. So before we get to the floor, what would you like to see change in the education system? Anybody? I, I, I'll start. Um, you know, I, I, I think the changes that are necessary um, from, from a business perspective need to be done on a collaborative basis. And there needs to be more engagement with the business community and how curriculums are being put together uh, to prepare students for the future. And, and, and I think that's number one. And I think historically, business has not been as engaged as they need to be in sharing the perspectives on what kind of skills, what kind of uh, opportunities are out there so that curriculums can be relevant and updated. So that, that would be number one in my mind. I think uh, number two, um, you know, creating an environment at the university level that really promotes flexibility and adaptability. Um, and, uh, you know, I think historically there has been too much structure, uh, you know, in the curriculum itself, and I think that prepares uh, future employees with the wrong mindset, that they need to be much more adaptable, they need to be much more accommodating to an environment that's going to have a lot more change, a lot more volatility, and I think that would be useful to get uh, students better prepared for, for business. Sarah? Yeah, I, I would compliment what Dennis is saying. Um, for the younger children, what we're talking about is introducing into the curriculum life skills. We need to have strong financial education programs and business management programs um, with an understanding and, and, and being built within the children that I may very well be an entrepreneur, that that's a very likely outcome for me. And here are some of the skills and things that I need to be thinking about as I grow into um, my future self, my entrepreneurial self. A second thing, um, adult education. Um, the U.S. is known for its community colleges and for the, um, very e the ease with which adults can go in, take a quick course, um, leave um, at any time of their life. And it's not always degree-oriented. It's about just continuous learning. Now, this is what we also need to see here um, in, the, in Asia, um, across all countries, of course. Um, just an ability for individuals, particularly potential entrepreneurs, to stop in and learn a little bit more about how to advance, how to develop their technology, how to develop a business plan, how to think about HR, how to think about scaling. Okay. Sehat uh, and Kojima, can I involve the audience first, and then we'll come back to you? Kojima-san, oh, quick yeah. one, quick one. Okay. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Okay, this is the important thing is the uh, business person and the school mm -hmm. should communicate to each other. Okay. And therefore, these days, uh, some of the business person, like our company's person, mm -hmm. will go to the middle school or high school mm -hmm. to teach something. What, uh, you know, business uh, society is uh, doing, mm -hmm. then uh, students are very much interested in, rather than the teacher's speech. <laughs> Good. Maybe, maybe I'll leave a bit, quick mm -hmm. one. So I, I, I think what's a lot of times missing when I see certain countries, so why they're so more successful than others. Okay, one area that, okay, that I think could be, could be very important for Indonesia is to focus on creating more uh, technical schools, like high school technical schools, to create more job op okay, If we want to focus on manufacturing, some of these technical schools need to be emphasized 
yes, it's important we need to have also more of the okay, uh, uh, university-oriented schools, mm -hmm. but then we also need to have the university types of jobs to be available. We need to have universities to be uh, okay, like, uh, like more, make the university to be more research-oriented types, but that requires funding from the government. There's a lot of things that, 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 that needs to be done, but that's only going to benefit a, a small percentage of the populations. Whether we are ready to do that, I don't know, okay, because we're not necessarily like we have a lot of money to solve all the problems in the world. So I think okay, the manufacture, the, we're studying a little bit of the, a little bit trial runs on some maybe on, on, on research oriented, just a, a token change for, for to start to get to get a feeling how this thing will work, but more on the money on, on creating more technical schools will be, uh, a middle technical build schools will be important. Very good. This is a great panel. I know I saw hands popping up. Could we have the mic, this gentleman here? Please just short intro and then get to the question. Well, my name is Vikas Porta. I represent an education company. We run schools all over the world. We have about 100. So it's quite apt that um, in terms of what's being discussed today on education, um, you know, there's two things that we need to focus on. Firstly is, um, you know, the statistics cited by UNESCO all show that universal access to education has nearly been achieved in this region. So there's not that many, that many more kids out of school. The real issue, I suppose, is in the quality of education issue. Um, you know, uh, I know statistics, for example, related to India, where, you know, I think, Gita, you mentioned that so many entrepreneurs, uh, so many PhDs come out of India. But the real issue is, in terms of 50% of kids in urban India still cannot read or write after five years of education. And I would probably guess it's not too different in this region also. So when you're looking at building an economy, when you're looking at building uh, economic progress, mm. uh, the issue on the quality of education is important. Mm. Uh, and it's refreshing to hear Mr. Nali's views with regards to human capital being actually the CEO's agenda and, and then being responsible for it. Thank you very much. So do you, do you have a question? It's a comment. No, it's a comment. Okay. <laughs> okay, Gita wants to comment on it while we bring the mic over the, to that gentleman over there. Gita, go for Gita. Okay. You comment first. Okay. Here's, here's, here's the challenge. Okay, I think on, on the primary and secondary, uh, we have much less of an issue as opposed to the plumbers, the polytechnics and the tertiaries, where we have much more of an issue. But here's the challenge for Indonesia in the next 5, 10, 15 years. You know, at the rate coal is selling at 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, sometimes $150, depending on the calorific value of it. If my kid tomorrow wants to be a businessman, he's going to be so seduced to want to be a coal trader. Mm. Even when I pound his head every day, every minute, for him to be the next Bill Gates, when he knows for a fact that the government ain't doing anything about providing fiscal incentives, you know, for anybody to do research and development, for anybody in Indonesia to get much more educated, so that for anybody to make sure that the framework within which we work from a legal standpoint is a safe runway. And I think the future of Indonesia will be pretty full of questions, or question marks, rather. I think sooner rather than later, the government has got to take a strategic and a tactical view in terms of making sure that risk taking is not just about doing the old norm, but it's got to be doing the new norm. And the new norm, I think, has got to be innovating, pioneering, and what have you. And that dovetails back to how we're approaching education from the very lowest level and how the government is able and ready to basically provide incentives and also disincentives as for us to shape the behavior of our citizens. Singapore has done that fantastically. China has done that or started doing that fantastically. I think we could learn. The other thing is we're not like the Indians. The Indians like to show their chest out. They like to take risks. And they're equipped with the education. Indonesians in general, I think, are willing and ready to take risks. But, you know, if we know 10 things, we may only want to sound out three things. That's, I think, part of the nature of Indonesians. And I think we can help with that much more easily than the former issues that we talk about. Thank you, Pagita. The question from there. 
my name is Tulus Tambunan from the Center for Industry and Small Medium Enterprise Studies, Trisakti. Uh, I'd like to have your opinion. Uh, we know that entrepreneurs are in all sectors, in agriculture, in mining, in industry. But in Indonesia, there are more and more traders and distributors than industrialists. Yeah. Even in the last 10 years, more and more Indonesians like to, to do franchising businesses than to open innovative-based businesses. Maybe from Singapore, a small county, it doesn't matter. There is no wrong with that. But for Indonesia as a big country, from the long-term economic development perspective, in my opinion, there is a kind of negative sign of the direction of entrepreneurship development. I'm still working on to find the answer or what, what are the main factors that uh, create this uh, development. The answer is coming. Okay, We have, uh, ever since eight months ago, we introduced the idea of incentivizing people to do anything that's value additive. And that includes the promulgation of government gov uh, regulation number 62, which basically gives a tax incentive. Uh, you know, you get a tax credit up to the 30% uh, of your investment value, which will be amortizable over six years. It's, it's a breakthrough. You know, ever since the World Bank told us 25 years ago not to take fiscal views on a lot of things, we've gotten so dogmatic with so many of these status quo view taking. Uh, and the other revolutionary thing, I think, is the tax holiday, which we've been able to basically, you know, break the ice with. Uh, the government regulation was signed in December last year after 25 years of not being able to break the ice. And this will be basically given to anybody that wants to manufacture large equipments or heavy equipments or steel making capabilities or uh, refining capacities, you know, anything that would be job creating on a large scale basis, anything that would be innovative or pioneering. I think if we can get this right, I think we can start talking about getting somebody to build microchips in Indonesia. Um, question for the lady from KO, I think. We have a mic there, and then the gentleman. Go on, Nina. Thank you very much. My name is Yoko Ishigura from uh, KO University in Tokyo. Uh, we often hear about this uh, need for the, uh, the dialogue between business schools and the government and multi-stakeholder solutions. And uh, I think that's what's needed. We, we often talk about it at the same time. For the, the new industries, such as IT, I think the business can play a significant role, particularly for the international migration, because we have, as Dennis mentioned, we have this big shortage of skills or the, the, the gap in skills and talent. When it comes to the established industries, I think the, the challenge is there because we tend to think you know, with the, the status quo, when in fact we need much more new skills. And what would be the, the role of the government in that sector when the, the, each country is, uh, is facing this high unemployment rate, first of all? And second of all, if we leave the, sec uh, the new industries uh, to businesses, I think they can take care of it, the international migration and so forth. But uh, w what would be the role of the business to make sure that the government will take some actions to renew the, the curriculum at the educational institutions and make sure that the newly required skills are going to be developed over the long run? Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to put that in a two-part question. I'm going to pass this question to Kojima-san. Kojima-san, you have about 27 foreigners, uh, 27 nationalities in the company. And yet, Japan has high unemployment. All right, so how do you justify that uh, migration of foreign talent into the country? Oh, yes. Maybe uh, that question is the uh, different country by country. Yes. And uh, let's uh, say, uh, in my case, uh, we have uh, a, uh, 200 offices in 80 countries throughout the world. And also, our company is uh, involved in all industries from the upstream to the downstream. Used to be a trading company, now we are an investment company. And uh, we will second the people to those uh, you know, investment company and uh, let them manage the company itself. Therefore, some of the company is a so-called uh, 
entrepreneurship type of a small company. But the important thing is the mother company, our company, have to look after those company and the management to educate the uh, management level people. And uh, besides, we purposely to exchange the, our, say, uh, employee mm. from India to Singapore or from uh, Thailand to Indonesia. And uh, these kind of things are very, very important. Mm. And uh, to exchange the uh, opinion and uh, sometimes the culture itself is different. Then, but uh, we like to make our company more global and we like to open the country, Japan, to outside. Mm. And in that sense, uh, human resources have to exchange each other. That's uh, basically very, very important. Eh? Mm. Then uh, the company itself is uh, very much prepared to support this kind of systems. Mm. And for PwC, you don't find a challenge um, doing this cross-country migration, Dennis? You find that governments are very much in favor of this? Well, I think it's a huge challenge. It's one of, the, one of the biggest issues we have to deal with in terms of our business is much more global today than it ever has been, and you go four, five years down the road, it'll even be more so. And so the portability of our people across border where it's easy to move without restrictions and regulations is a, is a huge challenge for us. And the good news is there's a lot of good dialogue and discussion taking place around how to solve that. In particular, in Europe, for example, um, you know, there's, there's really robust conversations taking place today in terms of how, you know, different people from different parts of Europe can move from one country to another without uh, restrictions, and, and we would welcome that. Uh, I think that, that is the sign of business, government, and others working together in a collaborative way to really deal with some fundamental issues here, and I think that's what's really necessary. I'd like to go back to the question that you posed, though, which is how can business help? I, I think there's a challenge here, which is how do you create forums between business, between educational institutions and governments to work in a very collaborative way to get these issues out on the table. Um, I think historically they've been addressed in a very siloed way, and the more we can level set this to bring the key uh, constituents to the debate to solve some of these problems is a way to at least get the conversation started. Uh, and I think I would certainly encourage that type of uh, approach. Would, would you have like a say with the Ministry of Education, Pagita? Hmm. Oh yeah, I mean I, I continuously have discussions with, with the Ministry of Education. I think uh, what we're doing right now is to ensure that there's, there's a synchronization of views. Uh, between ourselves and themselves, and also to make sure that there's a synchronization between what we're going to need in the next five to ten years from an industrialization, you know, our need to industrialize ourselves, and to make sure that uh, the primary, secondary, uh, non-tertiary, and tertiary will be supportive of that. Uh, we're not in a knowledge economy zone yet, uh, but, uh, you know, if we get this thing right, uh, and, and so far I think the ball has been rolling in the right direction. The question with Indonesia is not about direction. It's about the speed at which we're moving in that right direction. And, and I think, uh, you know, that tipping point is, is, is near. Okay. Yeah. Last question from the gentleman before we round up. Wolfgang Lehmacher from CVA. Um, I would like to have the view of the panel on corporate universities. And um, maybe one of the panelists can provide some uh, statistics on the migration of talent. Anybody? Corporate universities. Well, in, in Singapore's case, we have actually incentivized many of our corporates to set up a human capital and leadership center within their organization. And I think the reason is very clear. Singapore, we are not a manufacturing. We have 30% of our GDP. So we incentivize people to want to set up a cap, human capital resource center to grow the talent for the region. So we do give a lot of incentives when you do invest in setting up a corporate university within the country. I think Pagita knows about that as well. Yeah? Yeah. I just want to do a bit of a commercial here for Indonesia. The best investment you can make for all of you corporates is to sponsor as many government officials as possible for their own further education. You got to make sure that they think the way you do. And I want to I just convey the message that, you know, we're going to have to need many, many more on the government side to be able to think the way you do, to be able to see the world you do. And that's important. 
for us to be able to sit down and have a proper constructive dialogue about where we need to go. Okay. Uh, I just yes. want to add. Uh, uh, I happen to I happen to uh, talk to some people in the University of Berkeley about uh, where do they get the students that that uh, that's going to high level high higher le level uh, uh, degree like the PhD degrees. Actually, to my surprise, a, a lot of those uh, PhD degree candidates, uh, when I say a lot, means more than 50 percent uh, foreigners. So there seems to be a, a, a huge uh, brain drain from from the developing world to to the developed world. Okay, so this is something that could be a challenge in in the develop developing world if those those top of the top talents still continue to go to the to the developing to the developed world. Okay, final round robin. We we'll start with Dennis to take this conversation forward, Dennis, all right, to bring about this unleashing of the entrepreneurial uh, potential within all the people and all the talent in Asia. What's one thing that you think we should get going immediately? Um, I would use one word here, and that is globalization. In other words, it's no longer acceptable just to think about the challenges and issues in a given country because the issues you're really facing and trying to deal with are, you're, you're competing globally for talent, you're competing globally for capital, and therefore how that stacks up vis-a-vis -vis the best in class around the world I think is really critical, and that's what you ought to be benchmarking yourself against. Thank you. Sarah? Again, we have to think, we have to continue thinking about moving beyond microfinance and microenterprise, um, really to build economies, to end poverty, to find employment for people, we need to fuel entrepreneurship, and that's going to start at the, at the bottom, at the grassroots. And we need to move people up from microenterprise into the small business category. That's done with creative financing. That's done with supporting organizations like IDA that are working to provide the human capital skills that will allow people to do that. Okay. And Shima Dasan. Hi. Uh, uh, いろんな企業、いろんなサービスを見たときに、え、何があるかということを見極めれるか。要するに今の先進国が行っている産業が何があってそこで抜けているものが何であるかということをじっくり見れてそれを自分で想像できる人、そういう教育をしないと多分ダ
And therefore, the communication between the elderly people and the younger generation is also very, very important. Younger generation made have an entrepreneurship, but uh, say, elderly people have to, you know, well understand what they are doing, what they are desiring, and uh, these kinds of things are very, very important from now on. That's that, very good. There's mm. hope because Kojima-san is young at heart. <laughs> and Bagita. I see the glass half full for Indonesia. And the beauty about Indonesia is the demographics. People talk about an aging population. We have the opposite of that. And the other good news is we like to reproduce. And because of that, we're going to be able to maintain our demographic profile, the youthful demographic profile, for the next 10 to 15 years. I think this is going to be awesome. And I think the near black swan scenario for Indonesia in a good way would be for us to be able to take the right set of fiscal views strategically and tactically so that we can position our thesis in a constructive and better way in the years to come. Thanks. Thank you, Pagita. Please congratulate this panel for me yeah, for a great job. Thank you.